In the second lecture on diabetes mellitus, I'm going to focus on the complications of diabetes and then uh, do a brief discussion about the assessment of diabetes and an introduction to the treatment. And then in following videos, we'll look at specific treatment modalities, cover all the medications, and uh, end with a discussion on insulin therapy. So we can look at the complications of diabetes as either short-term or long-term. I'll talk about the short-term complications. These are the ones that more are, are more concerning clinically, have a more acute clinical presentation. Um, so having glycosuria is one of the major complications, and that is basically spilling glucose into the urine. Uh, when the blood sugar levels get up to 160, definitely 180 milligrams per deciliter, Anything over that, uh, we'll see sugar uh, glucose spilling into the urine. And that's because, remember, in the nephron, the primary functional unit of the kidney, uh, the ultrafiltrate, so that primary filtrate that's being pushed out of the blood vessels, contains, is, contains all your glucose. Uh, but then all of that should be reabsorbed, and there's a special reabsorption transporter. It's called the SGLT2. There's also an SGLT1. Um, and these transporters will pull in glucose from the proximal tubule and other parts of the nephron and reabsorb it. Unfortunately, when the blood sugars get up to 180 or more, uh, those transporters become swamped. And so you'll start to not reabsorb all of it. And some of it will end up in the urine with glycosuria. Well, the draining of the glucose in the urine has an osmotic effect. So it's, it drains the body of electrolytes, it pulls out water, it also drains you of calories. Um, and uh, so this osmotic pressure is rapidly dehydrating. So severe dehydration and electrolyte imbalances can occur from the glucosuria. And that's where we typically see increased urination, again, uh, increased thirst because of the fluid loss, polydipsia, and then increased appetite, polyphagia, needed to counter the loss of all those calories. Um, but even with that, even with eating a lot, the muscle loss um, and muscle wasting will be inevitable. Um, and patients often will have a ravenous appetite. Um, so that's something to think about. With ravenous appetite patients, think diabetes or potentially hyperthyroidism. Um, so that's one complication, just glucosuria. More severely is going to be diabetic ketoacidosis, which I've mentioned before. And that's because we essentially are switching into fatty acid. Uh, oxidation in the cells and in the liver, all of the excess acetyl-CoA from those fatty acids is converted into ketones. And the ketones are acidic, they will lower your blood pH, causing acidosis. Um, so we go from ketosis, which is a normal physiologic uh, ketone production, to ketoacidosis. And uh, the clinical presentation will be uh, what we call Kussmaul respirations, and that's rapid deep breathing. The lung is attempting to expel carbon dioxide to lower your blood pH. Remember, carbonic acid is the dissolved form of carbon dioxide in the blood when it combines with water. Um, and uh, that has an acidic effect, so it, that's a buffer system. So if we ventilate off the carbon dioxide, we should make the blood more alkaline. So the body's attempting to alkalize the blood by hyperventilating. Um, glucosuria, of course, metabolic acidosis, and that would be seen on uh, blood tests, you know, looking at the anion gap, for example, um, on the complete metabolic panel. Uh, ketonuria, so we see ketones as well as glucose in the urine. And then uh, these are both uh, commonly measured with the urine dipstick. So when you have those little dipsticks you put in the urine, one of the little markers on there will measure glucose, another will measure ketones. Uh, osmotic diuresis, so again, we're pulling out fluids, so we get frequent water and severe dehydration and volume depletion. So we won't see edema in ketoacidosis. We're going to see dehydration and uh, tissue wasting from that. Um, so this is quite severe because this could actually progress into a diabetic coma. And uh, so diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the things that can cause a diabetic coma. Um, patients you typically are have all of these signs and so the clinical presentation of DKA and uh, they are um, you know often going losing consciousness or becoming very disoriented and uh, they're rushed to the emergency room and uh, they're going to receive isotonic fluids to stabilize their circulation and uh, with continuous IV saline with potassium insulin and then will be monitored so that's a DKA but you can also develop diabetic keto uh, coma from severe hypoglycemia. 
And that typically happens in type one patients who overdose usually accidentally on insulin. They take too much insulin to develop severe hypoglycemia. I'll go over the hypoglycemia criteria later, um, but um, the treatment here would be IV glucose with injected glucagon. Um, now there's a third type of uh, possible cause of uh, diabetic coma, and that would be what's called hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. This is in patients with extreme hyperglycemia and extreme dehydration, usually due to lack of fluid intake. This is most typical in patients with type 2 diabetes who, or who have steroid-induced diabetes. Uh, commonly, these are elderly patients in nursing homes. Um, and this one is not associated with any overt nausea, vomiting, or rapid respirations like we saw in DKA. Uh, but the glucose levels could be over 1,800 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and the treatment here, so what's happening is all of the uh, glucose in the blood has an osmotic effect to pull fluid out of the cells. So the cells are literally uh, dehydrating within the brain and within other tissues, but the brain is where it's most noticeable. And uh, so the treatment here will be to try to stabilize that blood sugar with insulin, gradual rehydration and IV fluids. So those are three very serious complications of untreated diabetes or variants of diabetes. But probably the biggest one here is gonna be diabetic ketoacidosis uh, to keep in mind. Now where we're most worried about uh, things like type two diabetes is the chronic and long-term complications. And that happens through gly glycosylation. And that's attachment of glucose to proteins. Uh, typically occurs with any elevated blood glucose over time. And this is what causes most of the damage in chronic diabetes. And that glycosylation is happening on red cells but it's also happening in your capillary beds, on your uh, peripheral nerves, things like that. Um, and uh, the sort of combination of the uh, glucose with the proteins they attach to form what are called advanced glycation end products or ages. And it's these ages which really are, you know, the hallmark of glycosylated damage in the tissues. A um, couple of examples of glycosylated uh, proteins would be glycohemoglobin, which we've already seen, that's the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, and this is basically attachment of glucose to the globin portion, that's the protein portion in hemoglobin. And um, the amount of glucose in the blood will, the higher it is, the more globin will be glycosylated. So we can use the percentage of glycosylation as a measure of your blood sugar over the last three months generally. So we can, that's a nice marker. Instead of having to measure blood glucose every day, we can see what's your average glucose been over three months. That's the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, now there is another marker called fructosamine, and that's um, basically formed by the reaction of glucose and albumin. And uh, this indicates your average blood glucose over the prior two to three weeks. So if you need a test to see if you don't want to do just the fasting blood glucose, which has a lot of error, there's a lot of problems with getting the right data there. Uh, we might want to see over the last two weeks or so what a person's blood glucose has been, and that's where fructosamine could be used. I'll just say clinically, we rarely ever use that, but that's a, that is possible to do that. Um, so one of the big problems, again, is that the glycosylation is causing damage to your vascular system. And it's basically damaging endothelium, causing endothelial dysfunction in capillaries, but also arterioles and arteries. Um, so we get macrovascular effects, and that would include atherosclerotic changes, so plaque formation, and uh, so that would be along your coronary arteries or in your peripheral arteries. So we get coronary artery disease with increase of myocardial infarction, um, congestive heart failure maybe as a long-term result, cerebral vascular disease with stroke or transient ischemic attacks, and then in your extremities, the blockage of circulation can result in tissue necrosis, ulceration, but potentially gangrene requiring amputation. So if you ever get a chance to preceptor in vascular clinics, a lot of what they do there is just uh, do amputations and wound care for patients with advanced diabetes. Um, microvascular complications would be essentially things like the high, highland arterial sclerosis. Um, and uh, so that shouldn't be arterial, not atherosclerosis. Remember, arterial sclerosis is essentially the uh, fibrosis of small arterioles in the body, and they become stiff, they don't vasodilate adequately, and that drives up your blood pressure. 
um, the microvascular changes also will cause damage to your endothelium. And this results in um, arterial and capillary bed damage. Uh, there's poor wound healing, and that's going to result in damage specifically to the kidneys, causing diabetic retinop or nephropathy, the eyes, causing diabetic retinopathy, and the nerves, causing peripheral uh, neuropathy. And that can affect your peripheral sensory nerves, but also your autonomic nerves. So that's often forgotten in diabetes, that your autonomic nerves regulating bowel and bladder function can also become affected. So those are all the more serious uh, chronic complications uh, of uncontrolled diabetes. Now, one of the most significant organ systems that's affected beyond the cardiovascular system in general is the kidney uh, in long-term uh, diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, and this results in diabetic nephropathy. It's actually the most common cause of renal failure in the U.S., and it's preventable if the diabetes is brought under control. Uh, it affects about 20% of all patients with diabetes. So we're always looking as part of the workup in the continued exam of patients with diabetes, looking at their kidney function. Um, this results from poorly controlled blood glucose and often hypertension, which kind of, you know, in metabolic syndrome, they kind of go together, for example. Uh, this damages the nephrons through a variety of mechanisms. Uh, it damages, so if this is the schematic of the nephron, where remember we have the little afferent arterioles coming in to capillary beds, and then the efferent arterial bringing blood out. So this is the arterial blood going into the kidneys. And then the, uh, in the, in the uh, little capillary bed here, we're squeezing out the ultrafiltrate into the Bowman's capsule, and that's gonna pass down the, uh, the nephron. And then much of what we filtered out is gonna be reabsorbed into the peritubular capillaries and go back into systemic circulation. Um, so what can happen is that the glomerular, the uh, blood pressure and the changes in the endothelium result in hypertension here in the glomerular apparatus, as well as hyperfiltration. Um, and what that's usually because the afferent arter efferent arterial is constricted and the afferent arterial dilates. And um, so we get more blood flow going through there and we start filtering out more than we really should. Um, then the basement membrane, which is what is wrapping around here, thickens. And then um, the slit membranes. Remember, there's little cells here called podocytes, which are also covering the glomerulus. Um, the slit membranes and the podocytes also become widened, and we get increased cells called the mesangial cells there accumulating in the matrix. Um, so that is uh, the some of the kind of consequences of the um, high sugar and, and maybe high blood pressure damage to the nephron. Uh, the net result of this is loss of kidney function and possible kidney failure with proteinuria. So we spill protein into the urine and that can cause edema in the body because remember albumin, this is one of the main proteins we spill into the urine. Um, if that's not reabsorbed, we lose albumin in the blood and um, as a result, we get uh, edema. We get uh, the pitting edema that accumulates in the peripheral tissues. Um, the azotemia is another possible result, and that is the uh, elevation of the, um, the blood urea nitrogen, and that can progress into uremia, which is symptoms that we now get from elevated nitrogen waste products in the blood. Um, a decreased glomerular filtration rate, GFR, and an increased incidence of kidney and bladder infections from all that glucose in the urine now makes you more susceptible to infection. So these would all be some of the, the downstream effects. Um, diabetic nephropathy typically progresses through several stages. So we have preclinical uh, nephropathy. It shouldn't be neuropathy. Sorry, nephropathy. Um, we have preclinical nephropathy that occurs over the first few years. Uh, where we have the glomerular structural changes and then incipient um, nephropathy that occurs between 5 and 20 years with uh, decreased filtration, increased blood pressure, and then micro, we start to spill albumin into the urine. It's called microalbuminuria. Now, importantly, on the uh, urine dipstick, so that's another thing we look for in the dipstick is protein in the urine, and that, there's a little indicator that can detect albumin. Uh, with microalbuminuria, you're not going to actually see the dipstick change. You have to do a special test to check for uh, the lower levels of protein in the urine. 
Um, and uh, so I'll talk about that test here in just a second. Uh, and then after 20 to 30 years, we're going to see macroalbuminuria. Now we're going to see it on the dipstick in the urinalysis and then hypertension. That's the overt nephropathy. Um, the GFR gradually declines, starts to fall below its normal of 90, way down below 60, and we get the different stages of renal failure. And usually when the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate, falls below 15 milliliters per minute, then we're in end-stage uh, kidney disease. And this is going to require hemodialysis and renal transplant potentially. Um, so this is why prevention really is the key to this, because once we get to that end stage, this is not reversible. In fact, remember with kidney disease, we have five different stages. So stage one is basically uh, we have uh, hyperfunction and hypertrophy. Um, there's glomerular changes here, and the GFR starts to decrease uh, but when we get to stage two, now we're seeing more overt uh, pathology there. Stage three, we're going to start to see the microalbuminuria. And, um, and then going down to stage five, we're finally in the end stage renal disease. And our filtration rate is usually under 15. Um, so these are the, uh, the different, uh, the, kind of the natural history of diabetic nephropathy. So it occurs over decades. And again, we have, that's where we should be preventing this by controlling the blood sugar levels. Um, the diagnosis, um, diabetics should usually have testing done annually. So uh, we, for newly diagnosed diabetes patients, we always test both for type one and type two. We test their kidney function, and that would be on a complete metabolic panel, looking at creatinine, BUN, and then the GFR, that's calculated for you on the CMP, Complete Metabolic Panel. And then the urine microalbumin test. It's also called the albumin creatinine ratio test, ACR. So we can order that in addition to the CMP uh, for initial workup. And a normal level would be under uh, 30 milligrams in a 24 hour period. Uh, th this is actually for a 24 hour urine test, but the nice thing about the ACR and urine microalbumin test is it's a spot test. You don't need to do a 24 hour collection like we used to have to do with urine. Um, so microalbuminuria is when we get between 30 and uh, 299 milligrams and then macroalbuminuria is over 300 milligrams in 24 hours. So again, ACR is nice because we don't have to collect it over 24 hours, but we'll be able to tell if a person has any microalbuminuria. Um, we might also do imaging to rule out a UTI or kidney stones, polycystic kidney disease if that's suspected, etc. Uh, and then we stage uh, based on the GFR. I didn't put the GFR levels here, um, but you can look at the classic charts for GFR levels um, and uh, where a person is in terms of uh, renal disease with that. Okay, so the treatment would be essentially glycemic and blood pressure control. Um, now, we'll look at all of the different oral hypoglycemic agents we use for type 2 diabetes in following videos, um, but there's several different major classes, and we, there's a couple of them that we know specifically can help protect the kidneys, and that would be the GLP-1 agonists, and I'll talk about what these are later, the DPP-4 inhibitors, and then SGLT-2 inhibitors. So those seem to be renal sparing in patients with type 2 diabetes. Notice metformin and many other drugs you probably heard about for diabetes are not on this list. They are often used, but they themselves are not renal sparing. Um, certain blood pressure medications, even in patients with normal blood pressure, like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, these work by dilating the glomerular efferent arterioles to let more blood out of the uh, glomerulus. And um, basically this um, is renal protective. So you might see patients with normal blood pressure on a blood pressure medication, one of these two, and you're like, why did the doctor put them on a blood pressure medication? It's to protect their kidneys. And that's usually to put them on a very low dose, like a five milligram lisinopril, something like that. Um, unfortunately, if this uh, uncontrolled sugar continues, if damage continues on the kidneys, uh, patients may end up with end-stage renal disease and will need hemodialysis and again, uh, possible kidney transplant. So that's diabetic kidney disease. I spend a lot of time on that because it's something we, I think we sometimes forget about in the clinic, but we do wanna make sure uh, the kidneys are being monitored and protected in our diabetic patients. 
Now, another potential consequence of long-term complication of diabetes would be diabetic retinopathy, damage to the retina. Um, and this can result in blindness. It can also increase the risk of cataracts, glaucoma, and uh, diabetic retinopathy, where the, di the, the retina basically just becomes scarred um, and uh, the blood vessels uh, atrophy, and we get atrophy of the retina and, again, resulting blindness. Um, there is uh, the uh, retinal blood vessels themselves get damaged from all of the endothelium inside of them is glycosylated, and that's going to lead to decreased perfusion. Um, and so this is why we recommend for a diabetic patients that they get yearly dilated eye exams. So we can, with the fundoscope, of course, in the clinic, do a quick check on the retina, but they really need to have their iris dilated uh, at the, uh, uh, the eye doctor, and they can look at that. Now, a lot of uh, optometrists, optometrists are the ones that kind of just do the basic eye exams and fit you for glasses. They can usually, you know, look at the retina. They do, they can do the dilated eye exams, but many patients with diabetes will need to see an ophthalmologist. Um, that is a, a medical doctor who specializes in the eye and they can do more extensive testing and, and monitoring. Um, there's different types of diabetic retinopathy, either proliferative or non-proliferative. Usually the uh, non-proliferative increases and goes into proliferative diabetic retinopathy, but uh, both result in macular edema and uh, damage to the eye. And so there's different stages it goes through and we can classify that. But basically this is just to keep in mind that our patients should be referred uh, to at least the optometrist, but ideally the ophthalmo ophthalmologist once a year for a dilated eye exam. Now, diabetes can also affect the peripheral uh, nerves as well as the brain. And uh, this can result in peripheral neuropathy. Um, and so this can affect the sensory nerves, but I mentioned also it can affect the autonomic nerves. So classic presentations would be like nerve irritation, pain, pins and needles sensations, usually starting in the feet and the toes, the toes and feet moving upward, maybe in the hands as well. Um, and then patients will have poor proprioception and uh, they might damage joints, they might step on glass shards, things like that because of decreased sensitivity, not even know they have that. So this is why we are uh, uh, following this closely in our diabetic patients and doing things like regular diabetic foot exams, I'll talk about that here next, um, to assess any you know, loss of sensation but also any damage to the skin and so forth because the patient is not feeling uh, anything down there. Uh, poor wound healing also happens, and that's an interesting phenomenon where the nerves are actually involved in wound healing. We're finding more and more that the nervous system regulates things like your immune system. It regulates the uh, epithelial cells and things like that. So damage to those nerves, we're going to have poor wound healing. Um, autonomic nerve damage might result in things like postural hypotension, erectile dysfunction in males, bowel and bladder control problems. And then in the brain, the um, atherosclerotic changes um, might actually lead to, again, increased TIAs or possible ischemic stroke uh, and so forth. Uh, this, the brain also is going to suffer from any hypoglycemia you know, uh, due to you know, excessive insulin use, things like that. So the brain's very affected by excess and deficient insulin states. So that's diabetic uh, neuropathy and uh, effects also on the, the brain. Now the last complication I'll talk about here uh, with diabetes is diabetic foot, and that results from a combination of the vascular changes with peripheral neuropathy and an increased susceptibility to infections. Um, so we actually can get different stages of diabetic foot infections, uh, stage one through four. Stage one would be superficial infections, uh, abscesses and whatnot, but they can be very severe, go down to the bone. And this often results from just poor healing skin. All of those blood vessels and the nerves have, have been glycosylated and damaged. So we're getting uh, poor uh, you know, circulatory and nerve tone into the tissue. And so that's diabetic foot. And this is why we uh, tend to do diabetic foot exams with our patients at least once a year. Uh, but if they're ulcers, much more frequently, three to six times, uh, or every three to six months. Uh, we check the peripheral pulses check for neuropathy and sensation using the microfilament test, and then inspect the skin uh, for any calluses, sores, infections, uh, splinters, things like that. 
So this is the diabetic foot exam. It's part of the routine kind of visits we have with diabetic patients to um, include this at least once a year or more frequently if there are ulcerations. Okay, so that was some of the complications of diabetes. Next, I wanna talk about the assessment methods for diabetes. So I already went over the diagnostic criteria in terms of hemoglobin A1C and fasting glucose levels. I won't review that here, um, but um, this will be more about once we've established a diagnosis of diabetes, uh, what are kind of our next steps? Well, the first thing is if you have a patient who you suspect has diabetes, either type one, hopefully not, but potentially type two, um, and you're not a primary care provider, you can't order labs and whatnot, definitely refer that patient so they can get worked up uh, through primary care. But in primary care settings, we're typically going to, um, with uh, every visit, or at least two to four times a year, we're gonna go over a complete history with that patient. We're gonna look at dietary counseling, lifestyle exercise, and then recommend you know, smoking cessation if that's necessary. Uh, our physical exam is done at every visit or sometimes a little bit less frequently would be of course our vitals and blood pressure every visit, height, weight, BMI. Um, and then we would do annually our dilated eye exam, recommend a comprehensive foot exam uh, and dental exam. Uh, patients with diabetes are at much higher risk for dental infections, periodontitis and so forth. So they need a regular dental care. So that's gonna be our history and physical exam. Typical labs we would order in a primary care setting would be hemoglobin A1C uh, after diagnosis has been established and we initiate treatment. If they are diabetic, we're gonna look at the A1C every three to six months, usually until they're stabilized. Uh, a lipid panel every six to 12 months, and then a urine, unless it's normal, then we don't have to repeat it, but if it's abnormal every six to 12 months, and then the urine albumin, the creatinine ratio, ACR, we're gonna do that annually to check for microalbuminuria. Uh, serum creatinine uh, is gonna be another marker for kidney function again annually, um, and then a TSH initially, and if there's no higher suspicion of hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, there's no need to repeat the TSH for another couple of years, two, three years. Um, so typically we start at baseline and uh, see where things are at. Now, if the patient's symptomatic, if they have any cardiac symptoms, palpitations, excessive hypertension, uh, or if they're over 50 and they wanna start an exercise regimen, we just routinely do an ECG as well as a baseline. Um, annually, you should do a cardiovascular risk assessment, and that's using the uh, risk calculators. Now, if you look at the ASCVD risk calculator, it kind of, you know, if you have diabetes, that's one of the criteria. That's gonna assess your 10-year risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is gonna bump up a person's risk much higher. And um, typically, uh, for all patients with type two diabetes, and an ASCVD risk score of over 7.5% 7. 7 in 10 years, they're gonna be recommended statin therapy. That's kind of the baseline guideline currently. Um, patients with diabetes are routinely recommended to vaccinate uh, with the pneumococcus immunizations as well as influenza and hepatitis B if they haven't received that. So that would be the typical, but the, the main concern, especially in more elderly patients would be pneumococcus. Um, the influenza vaccines are really hit or miss. I think in 2020 this year, it's uh, the efficacy rate is like 10%, 15%. So some years it's higher, some years it's much lower. Um, so the red flags for diabetes mellitus, just to keep these in mind, these would require urgent or emergency referral. Um, and that would be very severe uh, hyperglycemia. Again, over 250, we, I put 250 as a conservative measure here. Uh, now, if they are over 250 but under 200 and they don't have any overt signs of dehydration uh, or cachexia or confusion or diabetic ketoacidosis, then it's possible to stabilize them on medication and monitor them. Um, if they are over 400, we're going to re refer immediately to the ED. Um, but generally over 250, we're getting concerned and we need to really monitor more closely. Um, severe hypoglycemia, and that would be any signs of hypoglycemia, especially in a patient taking insulin or a class of medication called sulfonylureas. That's another uh, oral hypoglycemic agent. Uh, metformin and the other medications typically do not cause hypoglycemia, but insulin and sulfonylureas are the big ones associated with that. Um, but patient might have agitation, sweating, dilated pupils, confusion, coma. 
uh, and the patients have to consume glucose, so glucose tablets, juice, etc. And the symptoms should improve within 15 to 20 minutes. Um, if you try this several times and they're not improving, that's when we consult uh, and we call 911. Um, in the U.S., there are over 48,000 hospitalizations for diabetic hypoglycemia. That was just, uh, I think, 2018. And uh, 13,000 hospitalizations for diabetic coma. And uh, 3 to 4% of all deaths in diabetics we uh, associate with hypoglycemia. So we are concerned about frequent episodes of hypoglycemia because it can cause permanent brain damage. That sugar yo-yoing back and forth. Uh, can cause uh, central nervous system atrophy and whatnot. Um, so that's severe hypoglycemia. If we have a patient with very poorly controlled type 1 or type 2 with symptoms of glycosuria um, and so forth that might progress to DKA, that's a patient we're probably going to refer. So this would be a patient we've tried a bunch of different meds on, the lifestyle, herbal medicines and whatnot. Uh, those are the patients we need to refer to endocrinology for maybe more specialized treatment. Um, untreated type 2 diabetes is obviously going to have an increased risk of all the things we've talked about, so we want to make sure we're controlling that. Um, if there's an increased tendency to infections, um, that's one of the things we always think about. If a patient hasn't been diagnosed with diabetes, you know, they're getting all these boils on the skin, abscesses frequently, they're getting frequent UTIs, maybe thrush. Diabetes is one thing to think about. If a patient has poor wound healing, uh, you know, that could be another sign of uh, undiagnosed diabetes. And then patients with hypertension, diabetics with hypertension, want to make sure their goal BP is under 130 over 80. So that's kind of where we need to make sure that uh, that's being monitored and addressed appropriately. So again, that's kind of the primary care overview of how we address diabetes mellitus. If you are a adjunctive care provider, acupuncturist, etc., then you're going to be referring out for this. But it's important for you to know kind of what we look for uh, in primary care and uh, what the red flags are for diabetes. So what are the treatments for diabetes? I'll introduce that here and then talk about this in more depth uh, in the following videos. Um, the goals of treatment really come from the American Diabetes Gu Guidelines, American Diabetes Association. Uh, we have a lot of other research looking at the use of adjunctive therapies and their benefits in lowering blood sugar and so forth. So I've kind of integrated all that into the therapeutic order here. Um, our main goals are obviously glucose control and then decreasing the risk of cardiovascular disease by especially looking at blood pressure and lipids. Now the short-term complications, remember, are diabetic ketoacidosis and severe dehydration. This occurs more primarily in type 1 versus type 2, but it can occur in type 2. And then the mic microvascular effects, uh, again, more common in type 2 because most type 1s are pretty tightly regulated if they're getting insulin treatment um, for that. And that would be retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy. And then macrovascular would be our coronary artery disease cerebral vascular disease, and peripheral artery disease. Um, so we have to first establish the level of treatment. Um, and let me actually, before I say that, let me just talk about the treatment targets for A1C. So patient that we've diagnosed, that's been diagnosed with diabetes, they have an A1C of 6.5% or greater. Our target actually is, um, you know, if they're between 6 and 7%. Now that target goes to 8% if a patient is frail, an older patient, um, a patient that has a life expectancy generally of under five years, or when the treatment risks outweigh the benefits. So in our older patients, a lot of the treatment risks actually are higher than the benefits, which is why we sometimes uh, set a different target there. Um, but generally most patients with diabetes are targeted as six to 7%. We wanna see a preprandial blood glucose before eating. Uh, of between 70 and 130, and that can be monitored using a home glucose meter, uh, or a two-hour postprandial after eating glucose of less than 180. So those are the targets we're trying to shoot for with therapy in uh, the diabetic patients. Uh, this is going to very vary depending on the duration of diabetes, again, the age life expectancy, comorbidities, as well as known cardiovascular or microvascular disease, and um, you know how aware is the patient around hypoglycemia, are they able to do self-care and monitor for that and so forth. So all these things will go into our equation when determining the right kind of treatment for a patient. But think six to 7% is the general target, 8% in these more specialized patient populations. 
Okay, so we're gonna establish the level of treatment, which would be the therapeutic order. Type one patients, that's insulin therapy. Boop, right off the bat. So that that's not a, let's try some herbs, things like that, that's going right to insulin. That's going to level four, uh, uh, I'm sorry, level three, which is uh, replacement therapy. And that is, um, I'll talk about the different insulin regimens here in just a bit. Um, typically with type two, we need to, we can start at level one and two, depending on their A1Cs. Um, now, if they come in with an A1C of over 10%, um, or spot glucose, like in the clinic, you know, of over 300, they have ketonuria. They're actually going into ketosis or potential ketoacidosis with severe weight loss. We're generally going to start that patient on insulin therapy. Now, I have plenty of patients with A1Cs over 10% where we can add in diet and exercise as well as the oral hypoglycemics, and we can see that drop uh, into the normal ranges again. So um, you don't always have to over 10% go that way, but it has to really depend on the patient. Um, I do have increasingly in numbers of patients now who really are not interested in a lot of diet lifestyle changes and I know they won't carry them out and follow through. So those are patients I might need to recommend insulin therapy to um, because I know they're not going to do the other things. Um, but typically, so usually with the type twos, we're going to start at level one, level two. If their A1C is over 7.5%, then we're going to think about starting level four therapies, uh, you know, starting oral hy hypoglycemic agents. And I'll go over the basic one here, basic ones here in just a minute. Um, but in many of those patients, a three month regimen of, of diet lifestyle changes might actually make all the difference. So it, it really depends on if a patient at very high risk for cardiovascular disease, et cetera, based on their ASCBD risk score, they're over 10%, for example, um, then I might go uh, you know, right to the level four therapies. If not, we might recommend a three month regimen, diet, exercise, maybe herbal therapy, et cetera. Um, if we suspect severe insulin deficiency in the type two patients, we're gonna to go to level three insulin replacement, and we're gonna monitor for any red flags or complications. Now we might need to make appropriate referrals. So if a patient um, you know, um, is not getting controlled with our therapies, consider endocrinology. Uh, if they have significant cardiovascular complications, if they have atrial fibrillation, uncontrolled hypertension, maybe cardiology, maybe a nutritionist, uh, psychotherapist, if there's any mental emotional disorders we need to work with, and then ophthalmologist again uh, for the uh, eye exam and uh, any potential treatments related to that. Um, so let me just go over the four levels of the therapeutic order and then we'll uh, look at them in detail in the coming videos on treatment. Um, so level one again is conditions for health and that would include diet, exercise, lifestyle, and stress reduction. So we have several diets we know are cardioprotective, and that would include the Mediterranean diet, but it's also um, you know, diabetes protective, uh, doing glycemic control, caloric restriction, and weight management. And I'll talk about diets in more depth in the coming videos. Uh, exercise, regular aerobic and anaerobic exercise, at least 30 to 60 minutes a day. Uh, typically, you know, the uh, American College of Cardiology and so forth, American Heart Association, recommends that if you're going to be doing, you know, sort of average, moderate level uh, exercise, we do it at 30 minutes, um, at least five times a week. If you're doing vigorous exercise, um, uh, you can do that 20 minutes, three times a week. Those would be like the very basal guideline, baseline, but we typically want to shoot over that if possible. And then uh, proper sleep hygiene, smoking and alcohol cessation or reduction, and then potential psychotherapy. So that's level one. Level two would be supporting salutogenesis, supporting the conditions for health um, through the organ systems. So this is where we can use our herbal therapies, acupuncture, hydrotherapy, manipulation therapy, etc., cetera, um, to support normal function. So I'll be reviewing in the coming videos some of the other neuroendocrine patterns like high cortisol, low thyroid, low DHEA, which are associated with insulin sensitivity. I find some of my type two diabetic patients respond much better to medications and the diet and exercise recommendations if we balance the different endocrine glands as well as organ systems. So if you're in Chinese medicine, uh, for instance, this is where you do your organ differentiation pattern, pattern differentiation. Um, and the most common organs we'd see involved would be your GI, liver, kidney, and heart cardiovascular. 
Uh, replacement therapy, again, would be the insulin replacement. Typically, insulin, and this is just a very brief introduction, we'll go into this in more detail. There's two ways of giving insulin. There's basal insulin, which is giving a long-acting 24-hour insulin. There are different types of insulin based on, uh, they put different stabilizers in the proteins. And so the uh, basal insulin actually is taken at bedtime, it has a 24-hour effect. And so we usually start patients, especially type 2 patients, on basal insulin, uh, type 1 as well. And then uh, they may need additional at meal times, and this will be true especially for type 1 patients, uh, what's called bolus insulin. So they take a short-acting insulin at meal times. And again, these are taken by injection or through an insulin pump. Most insulin pumps have bolus insulin only. They have a short-acting insulin that's constantly infused, so they don't usually take the basal insulins. Uh, level four would be addressing the um, uh, you know, insulin resistance through medication therapies, trying to suppress the excess hyperglycemia. Um, and this would be uh, for A1Cs, usually over 7.5, 8%. Uh, we're gonna think about jumping right to oral hyperglycemics. Again, I'll talk about these strategies uh, in our next series of videos. Um, with our classic oral hypoglycemic agents would include metformin, starting usually at 500 milligrams in the evening, uh, and then increasing 500 milligrams twice a day, and then up to 1,000 milligrams BID, so a max of 2,000 milligrams a day. I'll talk about the contraindications for metformin. Patients with more advanced stage 3B, 4, 5 renal disease can't take metformin, and uh, there's a lot of other potential nutrient deficiencies that can develop from metformin. So we'll talk about that later. And then sulfonylureas, these basically tell the beta cells to increase more insulin secretion. Another group of agents are the GLP-1 agonists. These are GLP-1 is a small intestine peptide, remember, that's released when you eat glucose. And there are GLP-1 receptors on the pancreas to tell the pancreas to secrete insulin. So these are mimicking your small intestine peptide. These are peptides, they have to be taken by injection and they have a lot of their own problems, but I'll talk about those too. SGLT2 inhibitors, these inhibit the um, uptake pump for glucose in the kidney. So they actually cause you to spill glucose into the urine. They cause glycosuria and that drives down your blood glucose. Uh, it also increases your risk of genital infections, unfortunately, but this is a very new agent and everyone in the uh, endocrinology community is raving about these now is our newest addition for um, diabetes care. And then there are several others. So these would be examples of oral hypoglycemic agents. Um, and then often patients with uh, type 2 diabetes, potentially type 1, will also be on cardiovascular agents, and that would be usually statins or some sort of blood pressure control like ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Um, and uh, so that'll be an additional set of meds you might see or might need to prescribe your patients if you're in a primary care setting. Um, now, one final comment I'll say about the oral hypoglycemics is that, you know, we have a, we'll see there's a whole list of them, but the more data we get, we find there's only a couple of them now that are actually associated with improving overall uh, lifespan in patients uh, and decreasing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So not all of our glucose-lowering medications actually have beneficial cardiovascular effects. We're finding that metformin definitely helps. Uh, the sulfonylureas don't. Uh, the GLP-1 agonists do. The SGLT2s do. But many of the others don't. And so we're sort of getting to this point where we're seeing the list of uh, oral hypoglycemics used in the clinic narrow down because we're finding that many of them lower blood sugar but they don't necessarily protect you from the uh, cardiovascular complications. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the treatment of diabetes. Um, again, we wanna differentiate what type of diabetes a patient have, has. If they're type one, they're gonna need insulin therapy, but type twos, depending on their A1Cs and their cardiovascular risks, may, uh, we may be able to start with level one and level two support first, and then gradually move into the level four therapies. Okay, so that's a summary of kind of the introduction to diabetes. The remaining videos will be on diabetes treatment.